Today we're going to talk about your midterm paper, which is your character analysis, or as the caterpillar from Alice in Wonderland would say, who are you? Right? Um, so just as you probably at this formative stage have kind of wrestled with who you are and your identity, uh, some of the most gripping musicals or plays are actors, are characters who are evolving, right? Who they're discovering their identity. Part of their identity is uncovered. I'm sure you've talked about these things in lit class, but we're going to talk specifically about the, the, um, your perspective. So there used to be this sort of myth in education that you could study objective objective truth without any bias. Um, and I would argue that you're always going to have your own perspective. Carrie Underwood could do the best impression of Julie Andrews, but her performance is still going to be different. It's going to be informed by what she thinks a good governess is, by her modern sensibilities about parenting, um, by her history as a country singer. Right? It's going to affect her tonality. It's going to affect her movement. All of that is part of her makeup. And um, even the best impression of Julie Andrews, it's going to be different. So in this um, character analysis, you are, are approaching a character. And you're bringing with it your own, for lack of a better word, emotional baggage. Right? The way that you play... Um, Alexander Hamilton or Elizabeth Schuyler would be different from a different classmate because you have a different nature when it comes to romance. You have a different perspective when it comes to parents. You have a different um, evolution and what you've been through and, um, you know, what you, your personal struggle. Some of you may be working a minimum wage, wage job and you uh, identify more with Alexander in his poverty right at the beginning of the play. Others of you drove, uh, you know, drive a Mercedes that your parents gave you when you turned 16. <laughs> you identify maybe more uh, with Burr. So you have your own baggage, your own perspective as an actor coming into a role. And part of what we do as good actors is separate and say, um, you know, all those things we talked about with the acting, uh, the uh, magic if and all of that. But you want to look at the text and dig into the text. And so I would encourage you to watch your play, whether it be Sound of Music or Hamilton, you know, watch it twice, watch it three times, um, because you really want to get those details, because that's what um, the art is in the details. So as an actor, you study the script in order to portray the character on stage as the author intended, right? So when um, Lin-Manuel Miranda sat down to write Hamilton, he had a certain perspective on the way that Alexander Hamilton would be played, and he wrote the part for himself, right? Um, but when you read those details and the way that he's acting and other people are saying, that's going to inform the way you walk. It's going to inform the way that your voice is. Maybe at the beginning, you're going to talk like you're young. And then when you're older uh, in the script, you're going to talk like an old man. So all of those hints from the script need to be noted. And um, we do that through a series of questions. Now, when I wrote my character analysis for my uh, master's project, it was 100 pages. So of course, and I think Hamilton is ripe for the imagination. Sound of Music is ripe for the imagination. I mean, you could spend a whole paper just talking about, you know, if it's Sound of Music, World War II, and, you know, Austria, and that set of circumstances that those particular people were going through. Um, you know, it's going to be it's a lot of information, but I'm only asking you to write two pages. So basically, you really need to come at this with a strong perspective and only 
we're starting the conversation halfway through the conversation. You have to know how many times I have listened to Hamilton, how many times I have listened to Sound of Music. I have most of the script memorized. So you don't have to start the conversation on a very elemental or introductory level. You can jump into the conversation farther along with me as your audience because I know both of these scripts very, very well, which is why I've picked them. So in a, as a professional actor, if I'm hired to portray a character on stage, I start doing this analysis in order to portray the character how the author intended. As I've already said repeatedly, it's subjective, right? How I would play Maria um, would be different from the way Julie Andrews plays Maria, right? Um, my idea of what a loose cannon is, uh, you know, how do we solve a problem like Maria? Uh, Julie Andrews' idea of a loose cannon is pretty tame because she's British, <laughs> you know. A loose cannon in Tennessee is different from a loose cannon in London, so um, it's going to be subjective to interpretation. And it should be based on your historical research of the time period. So I totally expect you to look at 1770, uh, the 1770s in America or the 1940s in Austria. I want you to dig into the history of it and on the script. Now we acknowledge that this is musical theater and probably the biggest critique that we've had of Hamilton has been, okay, this is a very romanticized view of America. This isn't actually what it was like. Um, you could definitely say the same thing as Sound of Music. You know, there are people um, dancing on mountaintops when it was what most people would have considered a very politically oppressive time. So you just have to know that the world of the script and the actual real life world are different, right? Um, and we acknowledge that. Hamilton is a very imaginative telling of, of America. Uh, Sound of Music is a very imaginative telling of Austria. So you're not necessarily having to research uh, real history, although you can do that because that informed these authors as they wrote the world of the play. You really want to research the world of play as they have written it. You know, so just like you can get in a whole argument with somebody about Star Wars and that world, it's not a world that ever really existed right? Um, one of my favorite comedians made a joke when everybody was flipping out about Hamilton um, and said, uh, you know, there was this movie in the 90s called uh, A Kid in King Arthur's Court. And, and you know, the comedian was like, what? There wasn't actually a kid in King Arthur's Court, right? It's, just, it's imaginative. It's not real life. So you, what you're writing this on is based on the world of the play as the author said it. We talked about that in chapter two in established genres. Musicals are always going to have an element of fantasy. They're not trying to um, write a prescribed world as it actually was. It's going to be romanticized. So brass tacks, two at least two full pages of content. Don't want a page and a half, at least two full pages with a max of four. If you're really on a roll and you wanna send me six, we can talk. Um, but I really think you're gonna be concise, you're gonna be content filled, um, and I'd rather it be uh, quality over quantity. I don't wanna overwhelm you um, as you dig into the world of the play, so. And that is two pages plus your work cited. And we'll talk about that at the end of the lecture today. All right. So we're going to just kind of broadly go over the worksheet that I've included in D2L, which is um, a series of questions you're expected to answer. I want to start by saying you don't have to answer every question. Only focus on those two pages. And if the third question is what really is getting you going and what you can write about, skip questions one and two. If the last question is really what gets you excited, you know, write most of the paper over that. Uh, don't feel a need to write, I'm skipping question three, right? I want you to write it as if um, these prompts didn't exist. You just write it. These are prompts, but write it. Um, uh, declamatorily. Don't include the questions in the paper. Does that make sense? And I've included an example that I wrote of Blanche from Glass Menagerie, so hopefully that's helpful to you. So one of the first things you want to ask is what does my character say about themselves? Are they claiming um, that they're a hard worker? Are they claiming uh, that um, you know they're always writing? Whatever they claim about themselves is what you're looking at. Now, not every character speaks about themselves. A more modest character, 
Um, like Eliza doesn't say anything about herself, right? Alexander can't wait to start, you know, always talking about himself. Now, perhaps even more importantly, what do other characters sing, right? In the case of Sound of Music, they sing a whole song about how difficult Maria is as a personality, right? So you're going to look at that lyrics of that song and say, okay, now what are they saying about this somewhat lovable but problematic person? So, for example, if you're writing your paper over Alexander Hamilton, you may want to talk about Burr's criticism of Hamilton. That would be pertinent information um, because his critical mind, you know, what you say about yourself may be different from what your worst critic thinks of you. And um, especially characters that don't have a very strong sense of reality, aka characters in musicals, <laughs> um, are not always going to be accurate in their reflections on themselves. So, so the third question in your series of prompts is, what's my motivation? And we talked about that as an important Stanislavski and technique. What's my motivation? Um, so, for example, for Angelica Schuyler, she's the oldest of the Schuyler sisters, and she has a whole song in Satisfied. She talks about how she has to provide for her family. She has to have a secure husband uh, who is dull but doesn't provide right? Whereas Eliza is free to marry who she is romantically interested in. So it just depends on your character as to what motivates them. In general, our big motivators are love and money. Um, you know, if we look at a character like Burr, revenge. A lot of classic characters, revenge is a, um, is a motivation. But you want to just focus in on one big motivator. Once again, this could be a 500 page, po you know, a huge uh, understanding of what motivates each character. But you want to just focus in on their primary motivator, right? Just what overall gets them out of bed in the morning. Because everybody's different, right? <laughs> I included this uh, tweet from Manuel Miranda when he calls himself the Slytherin. Um, because characters grow and change. Once again, if you have a character that you don't think grows and changes, then you don't have to include that uh, question. You can just skip that question. If you think your character is the same, you know, um, you know, if you have a Von, Von Trapp child that you've chosen to write your play uh, character analysis about, maybe they don't change from the beginning of the play to the begin, end, end of the play. Uh, if they're not the main character or a pretty title character, there's a chance they're not really going to grow much. Um, but if we look at the evolution of costume for Hamilton's character, right, we see at the beginning, uh, well, at the very, very beginning, doesn't even have a coat, but at the beginning when he is part of a group, he is in a uniform and he matches them and he's part of a team. Then he puts on that green and he stands out and it represents his wealth and his sort of peacock time of showing off and standing up to people then of course by the end of the play his son has passed and he's in mourning and he's in all black so we see the evolution of the character even through the costumes when we meet um, Maria at the beginning of the play she's dressed as a nun and then we see her show up at the Von Trapp house and she's in the ugliest dress they've ever seen right <laughs> Um, but then I would argue she gets prettier and prettier as the play goes on uh, because um, Rodgers and Hammerstein really want to, you know, um, continue to build that endearment to the character. And by the time they're waltzing and running away together, uh, we definitely see a more beautiful Maria uh, than at the beginning of the play. So sometimes it's very physical, sometimes it's very visual, and then other times it's more subtle. But in good writing, usually the main characters, the protagonists, are going to grow. <laughs> and there's my favorite villain. I love playing villains. Can we talk about it? I have, um, you know, I get cast in a lot of happy-go-lucky parts. I get cast as a lot of um, cheery sort of uh, best friend characters. Uh, but I, in the few villains I've played in my career, I love it, man. It's just so fun to be mean on stage. And I think that this... Um, King George the, George the Third is just one of those characters you love to hate, man. He's such a jerk. Um, so, and once again, you could write an entire 
100 page paper over King George and uh, what was going on politically at the time and what motivated him in his actions uh, in his uh, rebuttal to the United States and the way that he approached the United States. Uh, But we're going to try to keep it to two pages. (laughs) So uh, when you talk about what is their ownership in a societal context is really what I'm interested in you know, who do they love? Who do they feel like they're a part of what groups? You know, do they have a lot of ownership in their identity as an American, as an Austrian? You know, there's that beautiful moment in Sound of Music when Captain Von Trapp rips the the flag, the Nazi flag in half. I would definitely take a moment if you're going to write it about Captain Von Trapp, about his identity and who he sees himself as. Um, And, uh, you know, this sort of backstory, you know, is uh, sometimes has to be more imaginative. Sometimes you don't get all the details. And if your script doesn't offer a lot of details, you don't have to be that imaginative because it's only a four page paper. It's not a huge, uh, long paper. Um, But Stanislavski would and say to us that who your dad was, who your mom was, all of that Freudian stuff is really going to inform your behavior now. So um, famously, the group theater would, you know, spend volumes and volumes talking about who, you know, their parents were, even if that wasn't overtly discussed in the script. <laughs> Sorry, he's grabbing a scratch there. Uh, but it's a hip hop dance, you know, uh, and the, this is the Vogue shoot photo shoot by Annie Leibovitz, and I just think the pictures are beautiful. Man, um, Annie Leibovitz is such a great photographer, and these costumes are just stunning in my mind, especially those raw silk dresses. They just play so well under the light. But part of the reason I picked this picture of Thomas Jefferson, (laughs) uh, which is also the same actor who plays Lafayette, but I'm pretty sure this is Thomas Jefferson's outfit, Um, because, you know, not everybody liked Thomas Jefferson. When he walks on stage, you can see some people endeared to him and other people rolling their eyes. Where have you been, Thomas Jefferson? So um, once again, this is a question you can just skip uh, because it could be an entire 100-page paper just talking about how do you feel. But if you're going to make a character that's true to life, there are those characters, if you walk into a party hopefully not during COVID time. But if you walk into a party, there's going to be some people you're going to run over to and hug and say, oh, I haven't seen you in so long. There's going to be other people that when they start walking towards you, you you go to the bathroom, right? (laughs) Our dynamics with individual people are, you know, are unique to that person. So when Maria first gets to the Von Trapp household, the kids hate her. You know, and so um, that evolves, those relationships evolve over time. And so maybe if you're writing um, just from the perspective of one of the Von Trapp children, you would say, okay, how does this character relate? How does that relationship change with with her parents, with her governess? Um, How does that relationship evolve over time? If you get to this point, in the prompts and you're full up to four pages, skip this question, right? This question is food for thought, but not necessary necessarily. So the last thing that I do want to include for this particular um, class at this point in time is a work cited because you're going to have to use um, the Disney Plus Uh, You'll have to cite that, Um, but then there's a good chance in order to get some of the text of the script that you're going to have to use online sources if you want to direct quote, because um, the... I'm not giving you a script of Sound of Music. I'm not giving you a script of Hamilton. Now, I do have a copy of Hamilton, um, and I do have a copy, the libretto of Sound of Music, personally. So if you have a quote you want to say, okay, what act and scene number is that so I can cite it, um, then I could possibly help you with that research. Um, because you do want to give act and scene numbers uh, to the to the musical so that if someone were cross-referencing your paper, they would have a direct. Now you may see like for a Shakespeare play, they're going to have line numbers. You do not have to include line numbers um, because this is not um, poet. It's not written in poetry. So don't worry about the line numbers. If you're looking at citations, uh, then that could be it. But all those same rules for 
uh, works cited in an MLA 8th edition format. You want to make sure to use that hanging indent. So you can see here we have uh, the beginning of the works cited and then create an indentation uh, for everything after the first line. So this looks like a great paper, by the way. They're citing Black Panther, They're citing John Drury, which is one of my favorite playwrights. Um, I would love to read this hypothetical paper. But uh, if you have any questions about Hamilton, about Sound of Music, anything you'd like to chat about, I could talk four days about both of these plays. I love them both. And um, I feel like I have a good understanding of both. But I'm interested to hear your perspective because there's a lot of um, criticism of both of these plays. They both had a huge impact on the cultural conversation and uh, you know, Hamilton, I think, is still having that impact. Sound of Music definitely had an impact uh, when Rodgers and Hammerstein introduced it as some of the most popular um, musicians of their time. So uh, I hope you feel empowered to write this paper. Remember, it is due uh, at midterm. So make sure to keep that date on your calendar and get this in in a timely manner. As always, thank you for listening.